This is uh, chapter four of the social psychology textbook. Uh, the topic is self and identity. Who are you? Well, we have uh, reflexive thoughts, which is the ability to think about ourselves thinking. And uh, these can, uh, it's basically these thoughts reflect how we would like to be and also what um, we like others to see ourselves as being. And we have constructs, which are the abstract, theoretical concepts or variables that are not observable and are used to explain or clarify a phenomenon. The self is uh, historically a relatively new concept. The psychodynamic self. Freud believed uh, the unsocialized and selfish impulsive um, self, which is the id, is represented, uh, is um, re repressed and is kept in check by internalizing societal norms. So the superego, like, uh, yeah, the superego represses the id. But from time to time, uh, the repressions of the id, they uh, surface in the form of um, impulsivity. Okay, and uh, true self is brought about by hypnosis or through psychotherapy, according to Freud. Okay. And there's this idea of individual and collective self, which is that this, whether one is a self-individual or just a, a part of a collective phenomenon. Uh, descriptions of myself also describe others, and that the self can be thought of as a shared collective self or consciousness or whatever. And social psychologists consider groups to be made up of individuals who interact with others rather than uh, individuals who have a collective sense of shared identity. The collective self was proposed by um, by various people like Wundt, who in, in social psychology deal with uh, collective phenomena such as language, customs, myths, and religion, which could not be understood in psychology of isolated individuals. Uh, McDougall uh, wrote a book called The Group Mind, and that stated that interactions of individuals led to well, group mind. And this has a, rea a reality that is qualitatively distinct from isolated individuals that are uh, constituents of that particular group. There was a collective self that was grounded in the group life, and human interaction um, has emergent properties that endure and influence others. Symbolic interaction as self. The symbolic interactionalism is a theory of how the self emerges from human interaction and involves people trading symbols through language and gestures, uh, usually consensually, and represent abstract uh, properties rather than concrete objects. Looking glass self. Uh, it's the idea of a self derived from seeing ourselves as others see us. Self awareness is a theory of objective self awareness uh, proposed by uh, Juvel and Wicklund in 1972, who argued that self awareness is a state where one is aware of themselves as an object. When one is objectively self aware, they make comparisons between how uh, you actually are and how you would like to be. So basically, your ideal versus um, your actual self. Outcomes of this comparison is often a sense that you have shortcomings and negative emotions associated with uh, this recognition. People try to overcome their shortcomings by bringing themselves closer to that ideal standard. Objective uh, self-awareness is generated by anything that focuses uh, attention on oneself as an object. So for example, being in front of an audience or seeing yourself in the mirror, uh, Schkia in 1981 introduced self-awareness theory, in which I uh, proposed two different selves, the private self, which uh, includes what private thoughts, feelings and attitudes, and the public self, which is how others see you and, uh, yeah, it's a public image. So being self-conscious makes us feel anxious, uh, become tongue-tied, as uh, I'm probably doing now, and or make mistakes on task. Self-awareness can improve introspection, which intensifies emotions and improve performance of controlled um, effort sensitive tasks that do not require untrue skills. Uh, the idea of de-individuation is a process whereby people lose their sense of socialized individual identity and engage in unsocialized, well often anti-social behavior. Self-knowledge or self-esteem is, uh, they store cognitive information about the self as separate context-specific nodes where different contexts activate uh, different nodes slash uh, different aspects of the self. These uh, experiences of, of the self emerge from widely distributed brain activity across the medial prefrontal and medial uh, pre prefrontal cortex cortex of the brain. The self is complex and multifaceted with a large number of discrete self schemas. People are self schematic or on dimensions that are important to them, in which they think they are extreme and which they are certain the opposite does not hold. Uh, Lynn Veal suggested variety helps to buffer people from negative impact of life events by making sure that there are always self schemas from which they can derive a sense of satisfaction. Uh, self schemas though are rigidly compartmentalized and this has the disadvantage um, that causes extreme what mood swings according to whether a positive or negative self schema is primed. More, it's more integrated self schemas that are preferable or most preferable. Higgins in 1987 proposed the idea of self discrepancy theory, which is um, a consequence of making actual or ideal slash actual, basically like what, basically it is uh, self comparisons that reveal discrepancies, uh, as in as I stated before, comparing the ideal and the actual self, and uh, this fosters the need for self regulation. Uh, the actual self is how we currently are, the ideal is how we would like to be, and ought self is how we think we should be, 
Mm, I kind of don't really see much of a difference between the idea and itself. Anyway, regulatory focus theory is the promotion uh, focus that causes people to be approach orientated in uh, in constructing a sense of the self. A prevention focus causes people to be more cautious and avoidant in constructing that very sense of self. So yeah, I said it before. Promotion system is concerned with attainment of one's hopes and aspirations and ideas. Prevention system is concerned with fulfillment of one's duties and obligations, one's orts. Oh, so that kind of covers the difference between ideals and um, orts. As in ought being more to do with duty and ideals are uh, to do with uh, what, what one wants, like aspirations, etc. Okay, inferences from our behavior. Self perception theory is the idea that we gain knowledge of ourselves only making self attributions, through only making self attributions. For example, we infer our attitudes from our own behavior. There's the over justification effect, which is the absence of obvious, in the absence of obvious external dis uh, determinants of our behavior, we assume that we freely choose the behavior because we enjoy it. Condry in 1977 concluded that introducing external rewards may backfire by reducing motivation and enjoyment of a task that was previously intrinsically motivated. The trick is to reduce reliance on rewards that are task uh, contingent and make use of those that are performance contingent. Performance contingent strategies uh, are set to what targets and goals and self-monitoring, which measures achievement of the goals. Self-comparison and self-knowledge. Social comparison theory or com is the idea that one compares uh, their behaviors and opinions with those of others in order to establish the correct socially approved way of thinking and behaving. So in a way, like maybe seeing from the point of uh, Freud, it's a way of, uh, it's like the super ego, like just learning the values of society and whatnot. Okay, self-evaluation maintenance model. People are constrained to make uh, esteem damaging upward comparisons, and this can underplay or deny similarity to the target, or they can withdraw from their relationships with the target. Uh, Berging is basking in reflected glory, and name dropping to link yourself with desirable people or groups and thus improve other people's impressions of you. Uh, so that's just all about making good impressions. Many selves, multiple identities. Another idea is what self uh, complexity, which focuses on the self as defined by social identity, the group, and relationship among identities rather than the number of identities people have. People have a complex social identity if they have discrete social identities that do not share many attributes and a simple social identity if they have overlapping social identities and share many attributes. Grant and Hogg in 2012 stated that the number of identities one has and their overlap may be better explained in terms of the general property of social uh, identity prominence or how subjectively prominent um, it is for the individual overall and in a specific situation. Basically it's a particular identity in one's self concept Types of uh, self and identity, Tajfell and Turner in 1986 argued that there are two broad classes of identity. The social identity, which defines the self in terms of group membership, and this personal identity, which defines the self in terms of idiosyncratic traits and uh, close to the personal relationships. So that's kind of very similar to uh, public and private self. Brewer and Gardner in 1966 proposed the idea of free selves, the individual self, where personal traits uh, it includes personal traits that differentiate self from others. There's the relational self, which are connections and role relationships with significant others, and then there's the collective self, where the group membership, uh, where it's to do with group membership, basically. And um, the four types of identity, which was proposed by Brewer in 2001, basically it stated there's the person-based social identities, emphasized the internalization of group properties by individual group members as part of their self-concept. There's the relational social identities, which are defining self in relation to specific others with who one interacts in a group context. Group-based social identities include equal one being what equal to social identity defined uh, previously in, by Tajfell and Turner about like, what, identifying with group membership, yada yada. And then you have the collective identities, which um, again is identifying with a group membership, but it's not only to do with what shared self-defining attributes, but also it's to do with engaging in social actions that forge an image of what the group stands for and how it is represented or viewed by others. Okay, there's uh, Tashfell, 1970, on the idea of what contextual sensitivity of self and identity. He found um, he found that being categorized makes people discriminate against an outgroup and conform to the norms of an in-group. This expresses attitudes and feelings as well as indicates a sense of belonging and loyalty that favors the in-group in search of uh, self-coherence. Self-conceptual coherence provides continuing provides a continuing theme for our lives, an autobiography weaving various identities, selves together into a whole and more consistent person. We have this thing called the actor-observer effect, which is the tendency to attribute our own behaviors externally and others' behaviors internally. Uh, social identity theory is group membership and intergroup relations based on self-categorization, social comparison, and the construction of a shared self-definition in terms of in-group defining properties. Self-categorization theory, proposed by Turner, again, uh, is a theory of how processes of categorizing oneself as a group member produces social identity and group and intergroup behaviors. Prototypes, cognitive representations of the typical ideal defining feature of a category. And you have meta contrast principles, which is a prototype of a group, is that position within the group has the largest ratio of differences 
to in-group positions to differences to out-group positions. Consequences of social uh, identity salience. When a categorization becomes uh, psychological salient, psychologically salient, people's perception of themselves and others becomes depersonalized. This means that people no longer consider themselves or others as unique multidimensional persons by embodiments of, with embodiments of a, categor a categorical prototype. No, they have, they, they basically just see people as embodying prototypes slash stereotypes or like as a part of a group member instead of a rich complex individual. Swan et al. suggests that when this process is extreme, identity fusion arises such that one's personal identity becomes infused with social identity. Uh, group status is important because groups define social identity and defining our self-concepts and our own self-esteem uh, is tied to them. Social psychologists have identified three classes of motive that interact to influence self-construction and the search for self-knowledge. They include self-assessment, which is the motivation to seek out new information about ourselves to find out what sort of person we really are, and self-verification, which is seeking out information that verifies and conforms with what we already know about ourselves. And then we have uh, self-enhancement, which is the motivation to develop and promote a favorable image of the self. Self-affirmation theory is a theory that people reduce uh, the impact of threat to their self-concept by focusing on and affirming their competence in some other areas. So basically it's like saying, oh, I'm bad at this, but look, hey, I'm good at the other thing. Uh, Sadiq's in 1993 pitted three motives against one another, like self-assessment fostered greater self-reflection in peripheral than central traits. Uh, self-verification is greater self-reflection on central than peripheral traits. Self-enhancement is greater well, self-reflection on positive than well, compared to negative aspects of the self. Self-esteem. Self-esteem are the feelings about uh, evaluations of oneself. In Western countries, self-esteem is more directly addressed by over um, self-enhancement. Stigma. Uh, group attributes that mediate negative social evaluation of people belonging to the group. Now we have our uh, individual differences like uh, what well, violence was associated with high self-esteem. Individual self-esteem tends to vary between moderate and very high, not between low and high. And critics of low self-esteem argue that it is a product of alienating and stressful conditions. Uh, narcissism is a personality trait that is volatile and has compromise in self-love. And uh, in, they're basically inflamed with their view of self. They just love themselves a lot. And uh, yeah, they're feeling happy about their, and they have an inflated self-esteem. Okay, terror management theory is the notion that most humans uh, most human motivation is to reduce the terror of inevitability of death. Self-esteem may be centrally implicated in uh, effective terror management. High self-esteem makes people feel good uh, about themselves and feel immortal and positive and excited about life. One way to evaluate self-esteem against fear of death is through symbolic immortality by identifying with and defending cultural institutions and associated uh, worldview. Cultural institutions survive long after we are dead. Okay, and self-esteem as uh, sociometer. So people pursue self-esteem because it is a reliable indicator or monitor of social acceptance and belonging. It's strongly correlated. It's a 0.5 correlation with uh, reduced anxiety over social rejection and exclusivity. It helps. Self-esteem indicates uh, and shows that one has reduced anxiety over social rejection and ex whether it's exclusive or not. Okay, and this helps drive the need to form relationships and to belong. Impression management. People's use of strategies to get other people to view them in a positive light. Self-monitoring is uh, what was proposed. Uh, it's to do with carefully controlling how we present others. There are situated differences and individual differences in self-monitoring. Strategic self-presentation. Jones and Pittman in 1982 identified five stages. First, in this uh, strategic self-presentation is self-promotion. So you're trying to persuade others of your competence. Then you have in... in Ingrage, ingrage, what? Ingratiation. Trying to get others to like you. Oh, anyway, skip that. Im intimidation is trying to get others to think you're dangerous. Exemplification is trying to get others to regard you as morally respectable. And supplication is trying to get others to take pity on your on you being helpless and needy. Ingratiation is trying to get others to like you. No, I'll just say um, gratitude or self-gratitude, I don't know. Promoting self-gratitude to try and get others to like you. Anyway, self-presentation, last but not least, is the deliberate effort to act in ways that create particular impressions that are favorable of ourselves. Thanks for watching!